Good evening, everybody. How delightful it is to see you all. And uh, a shame we're not doing all of this in person. I remember with great fondness the last trip I did to Cambridge and, um, and uh, meeting some of you there. And lovely to see on this call as well some great uh, practitioners of the imagination, such as uh, Ruth Sapsed from Cambridge Curiosity and Imagination, a great hero of mine. So uh, it is uh, wonderful to be with you. And I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes, something like that. And, uh, and then we'll have some time for your questions and reflections, which is usually far more interesting uh, than me uh, talking. So I'm going to share some pictures with you. I'm going to talk about um, why the next 10 years needs to feel like a revolution of the imagination. And uh, part of this comes from uh, thoughts and insights that come from the writing of the book from what is to what if. Part of it comes from uh, things that have happened since then and a, a podcast that I, a series that I've started, which I'll mention again at the end and some of the conversations that have happened through that. So the, 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 the inquiry that started with the research for the book has very much continued uh, since then. And um, I wanna just start with a little bit of what the Extinction Rebellion movement might call tell the truth which is just a little kind of snapshot, I think, of where we are, in that in 2021, I feel like we have climbed to the top of a mountain. And some people have the most amazing views, more spectacular views than anyone has ever had before in human history. Absolutely not everybody. And beneath our feet, this mountain is a mountain of more debt and inequality and carbon and plastic. Uh, and anxiety and stress than we've ever stood on top of before. And um, the guides who are at our side who know this mountain really well are pointing to the dark clouds over there to the side and they're saying, you, can you see what's coming? We really need to get down off this mountain really, really fast. And for some people, for many of you, that's enough. They're the guides, they know the mountain. Let's get down off this mountain. For a lot of people that really doesn't seem to be working. And if what was needed to get them to join us coming down the mountain was facts and figures and reasoned arguments, then we would have started this in the 80s, when, as you can see from this uh, graph, it would have been so, so, so much easier. And I increasingly wonder whether a more skillful approach mightn't be to tell stories of the lower valleys of this mountain, the, the lower slopes, and the welcome that awaits us there, the warm food and the delicious wine and the comfortable mattress and the conviviality, the community, the dry socks that await us when we make our way down off this mountain. In many ways, I think the transition movement was always conceived of as being like somebody who would come and put their arm around your shoulder and say, come on, I'll show you the way down. It's not really that, it's really not that difficult. But for me, when you look at it like that, then our work right now is not to try and impress as many people as possible with correct information and figures and arguments, although that, of course, has a role. I think our, our, our work is more to cultivate the art of generating longing in people. How do we cultivate longing for a post-carbon world? That's not the work of facts and figures. That's the work of storytelling and imagination. That's how we cultivate longing in people. And that's really what I want to, to explore in this talk. What does it look like if our activism becomes around the cultivation of longing? This is a, just a, another little tell the truth bit, which I found the other day, which I thought was really interesting. If you are listening to this and you are 30, more than 50% of all of the global carbon emissions have occurred in your lifetime. If you're 50, it's about 75%. If you're 85, it's about 90%. This is not something that has all happened some way. This has happened on our watch. It continues to happen on our watch. So we need to be the people who actually sort this out uh, and get this under control. So imagination, why imagination? So I, I found myself reading people like Naomi Klein, Bill McKibben, people I really respect, climate change writers, who kept saying climate change is a failure of the imagination. This phrase kept coming at me from different places. I kept reading it in different articles and, and it kind of got under my skin. 
I was thinking, why would it be in 2020, though, 2021, that we're having a failure of the imagination? Surely we're brilliant at everything. Why, you know, why would we be having a failure of the imagination? It really kind of got to stick with me. And my favorite definition of what imagination is comes from John Dewey, who was an educationalist. And he said, he described it as the ability to see things as if they could be otherwise. The ability to see things as if they could be otherwise, which if there was ever a superpower that we need to cultivate in 2021, it is this. Because I feel like when Margaret Thatcher in the 80s said, there is no alternative, those words somehow lodged themselves deep into our psyche. And we live surrounded by institutions who are unable to imagine anything other than their continued existence in exactly the way they are. Uh, right now. This ability to see things as if they could be otherwise is absolutely precious and is under enormous uh, assault, I think, as I will go on to say. And I find at the moment uh, a, a huge amount of inspiration ar ar around this uh, from different, from often from uh, from writers of colour, actually, particularly in uh, Black American political writers who have done a lot of work around imagination for a long time. The phenomenal prison abolition movement, for example, which has dared to hold that what if question of what if there were no prisons for decades now, uh, in a way that is profoundly inspiring. And this is uh, Walida Imarisha, who uh, is a is a storyteller and who coordinates, does lots of what they call speculative fiction, this idea of telling stories of different futures. And she said in a book I read recently, whenever we try to envision a world without war, without violence, without prisons, without capitalism, we are engaging in speculative fiction. All organizing is science fiction. I just think that's extraordinary. All organizing is science fiction. Once the imagination is unshackled, liberation is limitless. You know, all the work that we do, trying to bring a different future alive in the imaginations of others, is profoundly political. And as she says, all organizing is science fiction. And one of the beautiful things about imagination, and I'm sure this, this is from uh, Dr. Seuss's book, Green Eggs and Ham, which I'm sure many of you can almost recite chunks of in your sleep from your own childhood, your children's childhood, your grandchildren's childhood. One of the things that is so interesting about the imagination to me is that it thrives best when it has limits. If I said, Anna, tell me a story. Uh, mm. but if I said, tell me a story about the mouse that lives uh, underneath the piano in your house and who has a tiny little piano himself and, and, and a big kind of Mexican hat, you know, then I've put limits around your imagination and you're off. This book came about because he was challenged by his publisher to write a book that just contained 50 words. And it took him two years. And he said it was the biggest sort of um, exercise his imagination ever had. So the beautiful thing that I see again and again when I visit transition groups and other kind of community organizations all across Europe is that it is the people who are recognizing and imposing limits. Uh, and living with those limits and being imaginative within those limits who are coming up with by far the most imaginative things. It's the people who imagine there are no limits who are often the most imaginatively starved uh, people. And so I was thinking, well, is this right that, that we are living in a time of a failure of the imagination? Is there any research to back that up? And it turns out there is. There was some very interesting research published in 20. Creativity Crisis by a researcher called Kyung Hee Kim in America, where she looked at something called the Torrance Test for Creative Thinking, kind of the gold standard creativity test, going back to the 1960s. And what she found was when she looked at this big data set going all the way back from the 60s until now, that imagination and IQ had risen together until the mid 90s, at which point IQ continued rising and imagination started to decline and has been declining ever since. She, she reviews this data every couple of years and the, the decline is ongoing. And she blamed this on the decline of play, the disappearance of kind of free unstructured play in children's lives, the rise of testing in schools uh, and the rise of screens in our lives. I think there are other things which I'll come on to, which add to that as well. And in many ways, I feel like we have created and live in a kind of a perfect storm, uh, what some people call a disimagination machine. And when, when this research was published, it made the front page of Newsweek. And it was a big soul searching in America. People said, what does this mean for economic growth? Or what does this mean for Pixar? Neither of which I care about particularly. 
But I do care about what that means for the climate movement and for the social justice movements and for all of the different movements, progressive movements for a better world right now, because you can only build what you can imagine. And if you can't imagine it, it's not going to happen. And if that ability to see things as if they could be otherwise is shrinking, we're really, really in trouble. So this idea of cultivating longing in people, how might we do that? Where do we start? I think one way is through bringing it to life. There's a beautiful exp um, saying of the poet Rilke, who said, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens. Future must enter into you a long time before it happens. How do we do that? This is the work of James Mackay, an artist at the University of Leeds, who draws the future. He works with scientists to bring their ideas to life in a way that's understandable to people. This is his idea of what a cities could like look like in 10 years, if right now, this is what Cambridge could look like if in 10 years there was a the longing was cultivated to say, we're going to make this the most biodiverse city in the world right now. Okay, let's get started. What might it look like in 10 years? It could look like this. If we decided actually we're going to take cars off the streets of our cities and instead what we're going to do with all that space? Cars take up so much space. Two thirds of the surface area of Los Angeles is dedicated to cars. If we get the cars out of the way as it's happening more and more in cities around the world, what do we do instead? Well, maybe we fill those areas with food being grown, our children walk to get to school through these gardens. This is entirely possible within our cities in within a small number of years if, if we cultivated the longing. And again, that's the work of imagination. That's the work of storytelling. So I'm always looking for these kind of ways that people are using to help us to see in the world that we have today what it could be like if we brought fresh ideas to that, if we refuse to believe that um, things just are as they are and they can't be changed. This is a little short little animation produced by um, the London National Park City campaign, an amazing project in London. Uh, this is a little like this is Fleet Street in London in 2021. What might it look like in 2031 if we decided to uh, to reimagine it? Maybe it look, might look like this. I think when we're able to bring these things alive for people, uh, it makes the most enormous difference. It's a really powerful way of looking at things. And this stuff is not just some crazy idea that's popped up in Rob Hopkins's head on a Sunday afternoon. This is already starting to happen around the world. This is in Barcelona, where the municipality in Barcelona are closing a third of the streets in the center of Barcelona and are turning those streets into forests and into places for community and play and connection and conviviality. Uh, you know, taking that space back, when you take the space back from the cars, amazing things can happen. You know, um, this is something I want to share with you, which you are pretty much the first people to see. So I mentioned I do a podcast. And in the podcast, I ask my guests, every episode has two guests, and I ask them at the beginning to close their eyes and imagine they're traveling to 2030. It's a 2030 that's not utopia, but it's the result of us doing everything we could possibly do uh, in order to, uh, to, to make the world a better place. And then I, whatever our what if question is that we've been exploring, whether it's, you know, what if we had a universal basic income or what if we decolonized education or something, I ask them to walk me through that world, describe it to us, take us on a day uh, in the life in that city. And what I did recently in, in that future is to take a few of those quotes and I've made three little short little one minute videos. I'm just going to show you two of them, which is just a few people talking and then working with two brilliant animators uh, who have animated over the top of them. So this is the first one. Going to be using re in our language we're going to be rebuilding refurbishing remaking reusing recreating reinventing the re is going to be a big part of our language police and prisons and the armed forces were massively defunded and that money has gone into robust preventative health care and well-being programs 
that also contributes to a rich imagination. Financial insecurity has been eradicated. People no longer go to work because they have no choice. And so all these workspaces that used to be occupied by big banks are now, of course, being redirected and used for creative spaces of all sorts, you know, whether it's technical or artistry. If you see girlfriends meet each other, they won't say, oh, you got this new dress, but they will say, oh, you got the same dress that you wore last <laughs> week, but now you've made a little change about it. And that's so fancy and that's so fashionable. This is the second one. I'll show you this one twice. The city really changed since the Ministry of Imagination was born. The city has become a huge laboratory in which everyone can participate. You can hear laughter, not just the laughter of children, but the laughter of adults. The place is alive with activity. There's people everywhere doing things. People can walk freely in their bodies, regardless of their shape, their size, their abilities, their gender expressions, the color of their skin, their age, and there's an embrace of that. We care about the things that we have. We cherish them, we repair them, we make sure that they will last for a very long time. Faces are beautifully lined, full of the marks of laughter and, and a life well lived. It smells like growing things. So, that, so there you go. So, so those are, those will be starting to go out. I've no idea there's a right red line appeared across the middle of the, of, of the screen. Anyway, um, so what I want to share with you today is uh, is this, which is we call the Imagination Sundial. It was developed by uh, Rob Shorter, uh, myself, based after um, the book. So this this was us looking at the, the after the after I'd finished writing the book. Um, um, pulling some of the ideas together into a graphic which was our, our attempt to answer the question if we accept that in 2021 we live in a time of imaginative poverty and we need to at great pace rebuild and expand our collective capacity for imagination what do we do where do we start and so this uh, there are four elements to this and at the end I'll put in you don't need to be squinting at all the tiny writing around the edge I'll put in a link where you can download a pdf of this so you can read all the little writing around the edge but this is really our attempt to, to do that and I'm going to go through each of these things and tell you some stories to bring them to life so the first one is space we all know that the imagination needs space in our own lives the times when we feel at our most imaginative are the times when there is space in our lives and um uh, this is an event that we did in, in, in Tottenham just before coronavirus arrived in our lives, uh, a day of what if dreaming about what a post carbon uh, future would look like. And, uh, and it was phenomenal. These spaces don't really happen unless we come together as communities and make them happen. Uh, and these, these kind of what I think of as what if spaces. We all know that we don't have our best ideas when we're really stressed and exhausted. Albert Einstein always had his best ideas came to him when he rode his bicycle uh, in the forest and but this that kind of space is disappearing out of our lives very very quickly we fill it with all kinds of different things the very addictive devices in our pockets the chief executive of Netflix recently said their biggest competitor as a business was sleep uh, and I think we need to look at a universal basic income, a four day working week, things like this as being national imagination strategies. If we're going to cultivate the conditions for a revival of the imagination, then we really have to, to, to work at giving people space to make that possible. So space is the first one. Place is the second one. What I mean by place is places that you go to and then afterwards when you go home again, you don't look at the place you came from in the same way anymore. It sort of changes your sense of what's possible. This is Waterloo Bridge in April 2019. Maybe some of you were there 
when Extinction Rebellion occupied, closed that bridge and occupied that bridge for two weeks. Uh, my wife was there for the whole two weeks. She was arrested three times. I'm very proud of her. And for those two weeks, they turned that bridge into a forest. And lots of people who work on either side of the bridge and walk backwards and forwards across it every day, normally thundering traffic, would stop and say, oh, this is amazing. Why can't it always be like this? And once people have had a taste of that, that's a really, really powerful thing to give, it sort of changes your sense of what's possible. I think we need a lot more places like that in our lives on different scales. This is in Houston, Texas. This is not a place that anybody loves. And uh, a guy called Jason Roberts runs a project called Better Block. What Better Block do is they go to a place like this in Houston, they talk to the people around, they say, what does this place need? What do you, what do you love? What do you long for? And then they go back to their laboratory and they create stuff. And, uh, and then they arrive one day at dusk, just when it started to get dark. They work through the night, and by the next day they've transformed this place into this place. They fill it with uh, small enterprises and community and conviviality and colour and spaces for people to connect. I like to think of it as being a kind of a pop-up tomorrow. Those sort of way that we can imagine a different future that we talked about at the beginning, how do we bring that to life for people? in their everyday world? How do we create these kind of pop-up tomorrows? They're one really great example. Another one comes from San Francisco where a group of artists were coming together to say, where can we find affordable exhibition space? Really hard in San Francisco as artists, how do we find affordable space to exhibit our work? And uh, then someone said, well, if you buy a car parking ticket for a car parking space, if, as long as you've bought a ticket for it, is there a law that says you have to put a car in it? Surely if you've bought a ticket, you could do anything in it. You could curl up in it and go to sleep if you wanted to, if you've got a ticket for it. So they started an event called Parking Day, which happens every year where people go, they buy a parking ticket, and then they turn that space into a garden in this one, or into a library or a little cafe, or uh, people got married in one once, I think, into all kinds of things, performance spaces, exhibition spaces. So you're shifting your thinking from seeing a par car parking space as being a car parking space to seeing it as low rent, affordable space in which you could do whatever you like. And it gives people a taste of a different way that city could be. You start to think, well, actually, what if all those car parking spaces were gardens, actually? How different would that be? Again, it's this idea of a pop-up uh, tomorrow. I think in many ways we have perfected the art over the last 40, 50, 60 years of designing architecture that is profoundly injurious to the human imagination. Uh, glass and steel and, and horrible sort of identikit buildings. This is the work of Hundertwasser, who was an extraordinary architect, uh, Austrian architect. This is his very famous Hundertwasser house in, in Austria. He said every house should be, should have a forest on the roof. It should be like a vertical village. It should be different textures and colors and materials. He said artists should design buildings because architects have forgotten how to design beautiful buildings. Artists should design them and architects then have to figure out how to build them. And uh, and I think how different would, our, would the imaginative lives of our cities be if we walk down more streets that looked like the Hundertwasser house. And sometimes place can also be a whole town or a whole city. This is um, uh, uh, a place called Ungersheim in the Alsace in the northeast of France, which is an amazing little town where, which was uh, a mining region. And in the, in the 80s, all the mines closed uh, with the big kind of impacts like we've seen here anywhere where there's an economic monoculture. And in 2011, they elected a new mayor called Jean-Claude Mensch. And Jean-Claude was a miner. He was a trades union organizer for the miners. His father was a miner too. And uh, he became the mayor. And about a year after he became the mayor, somebody showed him a video called In Transition 2.0, which you can find on YouTube, a film about the transition movement. And at the end of it, he said, let's do that, all of that. And they designed 21 actions for the 21st century which they've done all of now, I think, and now they're on to other things, really ambitious. And when you go to Ungersheim, you see how all of this stuff fits together, how the economics and the food and the energy and so on all fit together. They created the biggest solar farm in the region. They created a market garden to, to grow all of the food for all of the schools uh, in Ungersheim. They, uh, they, so all the, all the school food is organic uh, and locally grown. The, um, 
This is the, the building they were building called the conservatory, which was a place to then use surplus produce to make passata and chutneys and stuff to create more jobs for people. They have a local currency called the radish. They have a heritage wheat project. They grow, they make, uh, they're building a straw bale co-housing project, etc., etc., etc. One of my favorite things is that they sold their school bus and they bought a horse. And the horse takes the kids to school in this beautiful kind of carriage every day. And then when the kids are at school, the horse goes off and works in the market garden and then picks the kids up. It's, it's phenomenal. For me, it was really moving visiting there because it was like uh, this sort of vision I've had in my head for years and years about how the future could be. There it was in Ungersheim, creating work for people, improving people's quality of life, made over 100 new jobs there. Absolutely fantastic. So places like this are really important because the stories they tell become really infectious. There was a film in France called Qu'est-ce qu'on attend? What are we waiting for? That was made about Ungersheim, which has now been shown all over France and really, really inspired many, many people. So the story of a single place can, can be really, really impactful. So we've done place and we've done space. Two of the things I think are vital. The third one is practices. We're going to fire, refire the imagination of the communities around us. We need to have practices that support us to do that. And we have to start with an understanding that imagination to a degree is a function of privilege. If you are struggling to meet your basic needs in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs for food, for shelter, for security, for safety, it's really, really hard to live an imaginative life. And this is a part of our brain called the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain that is where our imagination and our memory fire from. So when you're being imaginative, what you're doing basically is going to the, the kind of cupboards of the memory in your hippocampus, and you're rummaging through those cupboards, looking for different things you've seen about, heard about, visited, read about. And when you're trying to imagine a better future, you're basically looking through those cupboards and when you take two different things and stick them together to create a new combination, that's the imagination piece. So we can only be as visionary and imaginative as we have stuff in our cupboards. If we go to our, to our imagination cupboards and they're empty, it's really hard to, to be able to think of a very different kind of a future. So, um, so one of the things that I was really keen to, to find when I started doing the research was, could I find a place that was working to expand the hippocampus? Because the hippocampus is the part of the brain that is uniquely out of all the other parts of the brain vulnerable to cortisol. When we are anxious, traumatized, in stress, depression, loneliness, the hippocampus shrinks by up to 20%. And when that happens, you lose that capacity to look at the future in hopeful and positive ways and you just get stuck down into the, into the present and into the past. And so I wanted to see if I could find a place that was deliberately setting out to expand the hippocampus, a kind of a campus for the hippocampus, if you like. And I ended up in Dundee, visiting an amazing project called Art Angel run by Rosalie Summerton here. And Rosalie, Art Angel is a project that works with people who have mental health problems, depression, burnout. But they say, when you come here, you're not a client or an artist preparing work. Year in Dundee in the biggest gallery in Dundee, and and it was phenomenal. People knew I was coming. They were really happy to share their stories with me. I heard stories of people who had been suicidal, who had had terrible burnout, all sorts of things. And then coming here, they had started to be able to see the future again. It was really, really moving. I spoke to one guy who had worked in local government for thirty years and then had a terrible burnout and very low self-esteem. And I said, "So, do you think of yourself as an artist?" And he paused and he said, aye, why not? You know, you could see people reimagining themselves because who they were before didn't work. And I said to Rosalie, how do you do this? What are you doing here? And she said, this is a place of safety and hope. It's what we create here is safety and hope. And every year to keep their funding going at Art Angel, they, um, they give their artists a piece of paper with two outlines of a human figure on them. They say, fill the first one to show how you felt before you came here, and the second to show how you feel now you've been coming here for a while. And, and I looked through a big pile of these, it was very moving. So I want to share one with you that really leapt out to me and I think needs little uh, So firstly, for me, this really captures the power of what they do there and the power of connecting with art, and with our reconnecting with our imaginations, actually. But secondly, 
for me, this is really what, if the next 10 years, you know, remember the next 10 years, we have to cut the carbon emissions of this country almost down to zero. It's unprecedented. It's never happened before. It would be the most phenomenal achievement if we managed to do it. And it will only happen because we were really able to see things as if they could be otherwise, and then make that a reality. When I look at this picture, this is for me is what that would feel like. This is what arriving in 2030, having lived through the most phenomenal coming together, collective purpose, collective sense of getting on and doing it in history would feel like if we actually got there. This is a kind of the, the image that kind of gets me out of bed every morning uh, to do the stuff that I do. So in terms of practices, there are lots of different things. One of them is this, which is a, an exercise called uh, Transition Town Anywhere, developed in, by the transition movement together with an organization called Encounters Arts where you have a big group of people between 100 and 400. You, um, you start by closing your eyes and imagining that you step into a 2030 that is different, uh, that, that, that is the result of us doing everything we possibly could do. And then you meet other people who share that thing you're interested in. And then you literally build that future out of cardboard and string and sticky tape and pens. You live in it, you trade in it, you inhabit it, you grieve in it, you celebrate in it. We recently, last weekend, did an online version of this as part of the What Next Summit, which has been organized by the Transition Network, which is just about to, this weekend as its last week, the What Next Week. But you can find many of the videos of the events we've done over the last couple of weeks uh, on YouTube and in different places. Uh, and the online version of this was, was really quite extraordinary as well. This might look to you like two kids sitting in a, with, with some chairs and some cardboard boxes. This was the last time we did it. These two young men here had, have built a public transport system for transition. They could tell you everything about this, the color of the tickets, the noise it made, what the seats are made of, where it went. For them, this was a completely three-dimensional uh, imagined thing. They could probably tell you what it smelt like, what it sounded like, everything about it. As I said, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens. If as activists, we can reconnect with the ability to play a different future. That's something really, really powerful that we lose from our activism at our peril, I think. And I, many people I've spoken to who've done this exercise, myself included, the thing that they played, they then went on to create because they'd had a taste of it. It created, if you like, uh, memories of the future in them, which once you've created those memories of the future, they become irresistible. They become like a new North Star and you won't be satisfied until you've created it, which is the work that we need to do on a much bigger scale. Another practice that's really important is the ability to tell really good what if questions. I just want to share a couple of examples with you. What I mean by a good what if question is obviously a question that starts with what if, but there is a kind of an art to it, which is asking a question which is open-ended. And Talos Mokas, somebody I write about in the book, he, he said a good what if question was like writing the first half of a really uh, um, um, audacious question on the blackboard and respecting people's right to finish that sentence. So it kind of gives you a glimpse of something but leaves it open for you to shape. So this is Dan Edelstein, Hilary Powell. They live in London in Walthamstow. Uh, she, he's a filmmaker, she's a printmaker, amazing printmaker. They became really concerned by seeing the rise of austerity in their community and particularly the rise of debt. And they said, what if this community responded to its debt crisis with playfulness and creativity? And when the last bank on their high street closed down, they took it over and occupied it as what they called an act of citizen money creation. And they started, you can see them hanging up behind them there, these notes. Now, these are not a local currency. These are like limited edition artworks, all signed on the back by Hillary as the manager of the bank. And each of these notes tells the story of a different hero, somebody stepping in to catch the people falling because of uh, government austerity. So, for example, the, the two Steves keep young men out of gangs. Uh, Tracy runs a local primary school who lost all of their funding for the arts, absolutely everything. Gary mortgaged his own house to turn it into a food bank because he could see the food need was so bad. And Sarah and her family run a project feeding, uh, feeding people, 200 people, two meals a day uh, at their own money they raised themselves. These are the heroes in these times that we need to celebrate. And they sold these notes in different denominations. And during the day, the bank, during the evening, the bank became like a... Um, a venue for talks about economics, new economics and stuff like that. 
So their aim was to sell £50,000 worth of these notes. They also produced uh, bonds. You could buy bonds in the Host Street Central Bank. This is a 50, this is a 100, this is a 10, this is a 20, and this is a 1,000 uh, note. And the idea was that they were going to raise £50,000, which they did. And, uh, uh, and then they wrote. And so half of that money was then distributed between these four charities. The other half, and there's a film called The Bank Job that came out recently, which tells the whole story, and it's amazing. The other half, they took to the secondary debt market, which is where debt is bought and sold. Uh, a whole murky world none of us know very much about. And with their £25,000, they were able to buy £1.2 million worth of Wandsworth-based payday lending, well, sorry, Walthamstow-based payday lending debt. And they wrote to all of those people and said, you know that debt you had? You don't have it anymore. Good luck. Have a good life. We don't expect anything in return. But if you'd like to join us uh, on the 10th of May on a site overlooking Canary Wharf, you'd be very welcome. And when people went there, they found this van painted gold, filled with bits of paper with the word debt written on it. And then at 10 o'clock that morning, the van was exploded uh, in a controlled explosion. And they then collected up every single piece of glass and, and metal. And people who had bought bonds were then sent these. This is my piece of the, of the, of the windscreen of the car. This is a piece of metal uh, from the car. It says on the van, it says on here, this artifact is a certified fragment from the wreckage of Big Bang 2, the controlled explosion of 1.2 million of abolished debt. And some people uh, even then got sent, this is a commemorative coin made out of melted down metal from the van. So what I love about this project is they were motivated by seeing something that was terribly wrong in the world around them. They could have just started a petition or a blog or something. What they did was they took over a bank and they printed money and they invited in school groups and different groups and they did events in the evening to raise awareness locally and then they blew up a van and they made coins and da 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 da, da. It's a phenomenal project. And when you bring imagination into activism, so, so much can happen. This is another what if question that I love. This is from Liège in Belgium, where the transition group uh, Liège en Transition about seven years ago said, what if in a generation's time, the majority of food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège. It opens up, it gives you a taste of that as a possibility. I went there about seven years ago, they had come up with this question, they, they held a big event, they invited everyone who cared about food, it was amazing. I then came home, didn't hear that much, went back two years ago. In that time in Liège, they started 25 new cooperatives that have arisen out of the asking of that question. They raised five million euros of investment from local people to make that happen. Just extraordinary. They started a shop called the Small Producers in the middle of Liège, which did so well, they now have four. They started two vineyards, uh, a brewery, uh, which I had to visit, you know. Um, uh, uh, they started a farm. All of this, I'm just amazing. And uh, when I met the mayor of the city, he said, yeah, we used to say we want to be a smart city. Now we want to be a transition city. This is the story of our city. And uh, our role is just to get out of the way and to remove all the blockages. It's now how the city is reimagining how its schools, its cities, its hospitals procure their food to drive this ec economic shift. The municipality mapped all of the land they owned around Liège, had it all tested for contamination, and are making it all available for people who want to start food businesses as part of this umbrella of Centure à la Montère Liégeoise. Just amazing. Again, but it started with a really great what if question that had that kind of invitational element to it. And I've loved to see during lockdown over the last year, how many groups, partly inspired by the book, I think, who have used what if to frame their conversations and thinking about what comes next. This is Truro in Cornwall, Transition Truro, every day for a month, posted a different what if question. What if we were all involved in local decision making? What if car parks became play parks? What if birdsong drowned out the traffic? What if old and young came together to learn from each other? This is one of my favorites. What if there was a daily imagination lesson? And after 30 days of doing this, people had kind of got the idea of it. And then, so this was the last one they posted where they didn't even have to put the whole, all of the words anymore. People understood the basic idea. And the picture that they finished with was about what if we lived in a future of conviviality and, and contentment and connection 
and that and and I, this picture just captures it beautifully for me. In Sweden, the Green Party did an advertising campaign where they just took the words "what if" and put them over images of things that already exist, solar panels. I love this one, which went went kind of deeper and was, "What if we lived in a future where?" father could take the day to go to the woods with his kids and play all day and not feel guilty that he wasn't on his email you know what if we actually really really encouraged this what if i just love this is what if our cities uh, and and i mentioned before the podcast that i do what we do in that is every episode we take a different what if question and really try to explore what if it actually became a reality? What would it be like to live in that world? To move beyond that idea of debating whether this is a good idea or not, and I need someone for and someone against. Actually, we're going to come together and we're going to say, well, what would it be like to wake up in 10 years and this thing is actually a reality? What would it smell like? What would it feel like? And what if is really powerful for that? This is uh, in London where uh, this looks like a sort of uh, worst case health and safety uh, poster, um, but um, hopefully there's somebody bottom anyway this is in in camden where transition uh, kentish transition kentish town and xr camden and friends of the earth camden and camden council came together camden council declared a climate emergency they were i think the first local government to run a climate um citizens assembly and to declare an emergency as i said and they together they opened this thing called think and do uh, right on the high street, it was an old cafe on the high street. They opened it for two months as a as a climate imagination space. It was phenomenal, and uh, it was a lot of it was framed around what if, gathering people's ideas. It was in use for all different organisations and groups running workshops uh, and different things going on. It was a beautiful example of creating a what if space on a high street. And I've loved hearing over the last few months of transition groups in, in all different parts of the country planning what they call imaginariums, spaces on the high street, which are there to facilitate this kind of imagining that so urgently needs to happen. And one of the things they did after that was they took over, they did a big project called Camden Future Journal. Camden New Journal is, is their local newspaper. And uh, they, they, they invited people all across Camden to write stories from 2030 some really upbeat, some not so, really poetry, drawings, they work with schools, with different community groups, really engage the diversity uh, of that community. And they created a, a um, like a wraparound for their local newspaper. And their local newspaper then made it the whole, that whole episode of the journal became all about uh, green stories from Camden. And there's a beautiful thing you can find online on the Transition Network's website. I'll give you the link at the end. You can find a whole article about this and a link to, they then did a hundred page version of the Camden Future Journal with all of these stories. It's a really beautiful uh, thing to have a look. Okay, so we're nearly there. All we've done place and space and practices. The last one is pacts. It's kind of a weird word to use in relation to imagination. Why do we need imagination pacts? Well, this idea came around from, um, a story that I heard really near the end of writing the book and I had about two weeks before my deadline and I scurried about all over the place to try and get this story. This is from Bologna in Italy where the mayor of Bologna in about 2012 began to realize that something was going really wrong uh, in Bologna. The, they just had an election with, with record low turnout in the election and they were really worried about it and then somebody came to them and said I want to paint the bench on my street a different colour. Do you realise if I do that, it'll take me nine months and I have to go through six different government departments just to paint that bench. This is ridiculous. So the municipality started to think in a different way. And they created what they called a civic imagination office, not a civic participation office or a civic, I don't know, engagement office or something civic imagination office they opened six laboratories around the city and in each of those laboratories they would run big imagining visioning exercises uh, where they would invite all the people around really really well facilitated positive imagining a different kind of a future the brilliant bit was that when people came up with good ideas the municipality would sit with them and say that's a great idea. OK, how do we make that a reality? We can offer you this, 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 and we can bring some of that and we can offer you that. You can do that and that. Good. OK, let's make a pact. And in the last five years in Bologna, they've made 500 pacts 
from really small things like new gardens on streets through to taking over an old office block and turning it into a school to train young people as classical musicians. The Civic Imagination Office now is how they do their participatory budgeting. Uh, it's become a real part of, of how they work. And what I love about it is that in a time when our imaginations are so rarely considered, almost never invited, they're distrusted, they're marginalized, belittled, ignored, patronized, humiliated sometimes, Meeting it in the middle is really, really powerful. If every organization is to work with the people who it is in service to, to invite their imagination and then meet it in the middle and create pacts, that becomes such a powerful piece of that kind of imagination infrastructure that we need to build uh, as a nation. So that's what I wanted to share with you today was this idea of an imagination sundial. And as I said, I'll, I'll put a link into this where you can find the find the, 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 the high resolution version of it. But just to wrap up, I think for me, transition movement is really, there are many ways you can look at what the transition movement does. It's an environmental process. It's a community development approach. It's an economic regeneration approach. It's, uh, you know, it's a, a set of tools for, building our resilience as activists. It's lots of different things. For me, one of the things that it is, is, is that it, it creates and holds what if spaces. It allows people to get tastes of what a different future could be like now, whether small or big. And I really have come to appreciate over years that small projects matter just as much as the big, really ambitious projects, whether you're just planting some trees or maybe you're opening a shop or you're starting a community energy company or a co-housing project, or maybe you're doing like in Liège where they're reimagining a whole city's food system. It doesn't matter. All of those things are giving people a taste today of how that future could be in a way that they can meet it and touch it and feel it and get to know it. It's like, I remember going to the Crystal Palace food market in London, started by Crystal Palace Transition Town. And I said to them, why do you do this? It was amazing. They won loads of awards for the best food market in London. I said, why do you do this? They said, we want our children to grow up thinking that this is normal. And that's really what a lot of this is about. How do we bring it alive and help people to really experience that? So uh, we, can, we can have some time for your thoughts. I just want to uh, point to a couple of things. So robhopkins.net is the blog that I do. If you've read the book and there are people that I speak to in the book who you are interested in, um, you can find all of those interviews in full on, on the website, uh, often with audio as well. Transitionnetwork.org is where to find out about the transition movement. Again, just to mention the, the What Next Summit goes into its last week this week. Do come and join us for that. And you can find videos uh, from previous sessions on YouTube now. And uh, the podcast that I do from What If to What Next, we publish uh, every other week, there's an edition goes out. And then every week in between that, we do a bonus episode called uh, The Ministry of Imagination. We're now up to episode 23. Uh, we just did um, What If Street Art Could Transform the World. We're about to do What If We Read More Books. Uh, and uh, there are many, many amazing episodes and do uh, subscribe and, and get involved with that. If you enjoyed the book, it's a really beautiful kind of continuation on uh, of the ideas that were involved in the book. Ah, that's me. Uh, and I think now hopefully we have some time for your thoughts and reflections and questions. And thank you very much for your attention uh, this evening. Thank you.